uh, Nick Cook speaking large deviations of subgraph counts for sparse Erdős-Rényi graphs. Okay, so uh, uh, thanks very much to the to the organizers for this opportunity uh, to talk and, uh, and uh, happy birthday to 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 uh, Amir. Um, so so I'm, my talk is about uh, some actually some things that Amir has been thinking about very recently. Um, I have here a picture of uh, from one of our earlier meetings on this um, discussions on this on this problem, and I remember in this meeting he said uh, he decided he'd give me a five minute crash course on on large deviations, uh, and it, it ended with him saying, "There now you know everything about large deviations." <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, so I, I mean, this I, I think is not really the best uh, advertisement for his, for his textbook. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, if you can get him to, to get me that, that talk, it's uh, to save you some money. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, just, uh, but um, uh, seriously, it's, it's been uh, uh, a great pleasure to work with him, and I've, and I've learned uh, quite a lot from him, and I'm very, very grateful for the time, time he gave. Um, Okay, so uh, so I'd like to start this talk with something that everybody knows, um, uh, which, uh, classical CLTs and large deviation principles for uh, for partial sums of IID variables. Uh, so so XI uh, will be IID uh, <coughs> unit variance uh, finite exponential moments, as soon as a partial sum. So the, the CLT goes back a very long way. And it says that if you look at this variable at scale square root of n, uh, then you get convergence to this universal uh, Gaussian measure. Uh, the large deviations principle, uh, going back to Cromer, and also in some sense uh, Laplace, um, says that if, if you look at scale n, um, it's, it's more interesting in, in, the, in sort of the sense of uh, variety. Uh, so, so this, um, this probability will now be exponentially small, but after you take a log and divide by n, then you still get convergence to a non-trivial limit uh, called the rate function, uh, and it's a, it's a non-universal object, so it depends uh, very heavily on what, what variable you, you uh, on the distribution of the sum ends. Um, so if the xi's are Gaussian, then it'll be a parabola. If they're Bernoulli, then it's uh, compactly supported. Okay. And, and you can extend uh, both of these to, to, uh, to weighted sums, the, the conditions on the weights. Um, and and uh, a weighted sum, of course, you can view as a, a linear functional on a product probability space. So the partial sums are just the inner product with the vector of all ones. And so then it's, it's uh, with this perspective, it's, it's natural to ask about what you could say about classes of, of nonlinear functions. Um, so is the subject of this talk. And when I say nonlinear functions, all, all of the nonlinear functions I'll, I'll talk about today are uh, low degree polynomials. Okay, so this brings us to more uh, recent uh, stuff. And I'll just give a couple of examples. Um, so uh, one nice nonlinear function is the number of triangles in an Erdős Rényi graph. <coughs> so let GNP be an Erdős Rényi graph on n vertices, uh, and then we'll consider this third spectral moment um, of the adjacency matrix, which you uh, can express in the entries this way. So you see this is a, a cubic polynomial on a product space of dimension <coughs> n choose 2. Um, and this third spectral moment is just 6 times the number of triangles in the graph. Uh, so it's easy to see that its expectation is essentially n cubed p cubed. Central limit theorems are, well, they're not new, but they're newer than uh, Laplace. Uh, so, so Ruchinsky obtained a, a CLT, and then with um, Barber and Karonsky, uh, they got a um, sort of a very insane type, uh, type um, quantitative result using Stein's method. And that they also considered um, a general subgraph count. So large deviations is much more recent in the, in the, the, the focus of this talk. Um, and a whole lot of people have worked on this um, in the past few years uh, for, 
for dense graphs, there was a, a work of Chatterjee and Baradan that I'll talk about. Um, and then that for, for sparse graphs, you need to sort of be more quantitative. And there was a, a very inspiring work of Amir and, and, and Surav um, that sort of <coughs> inspired a, a lot of these others that I'll go into in more depth uh, later in the talk. OK. Uh, and just to sort of give you an, some variety, I, I won't talk about this at all after this slide. Um, but another another example you could consider that, that people have considered is is uh, to count uh, k-term arithmetic progressions in sparse random sets. Uh, so you take a, uh, um, a random subset of the tor discrete torus where membership is is uh, determined by IID indicators, and then uh, consider say the number of three-term arithmetic progressions. Um, then uh, um, analogous results to the results for uh, triangle counts have been established. Um, okay, so um, so now I'll go into this uh, sort of new subject that's going under the heading of nonlinear large deviations. Uh, so so in in the general setting, we're considering functions on a product space, and they don't have to be the binary cube, um, but I'll just stick to the binary cube for this talk. And there's sort of, uh, there's four types of, of questions, general questions we're interested in, which are sorted into this two by two table. Um, so on the one hand, uh, we're interested in large deviations. Uh, so we have uh, a fixed, uh, a reference measure, a product Bernoulli measure. And then we want to understand the, the tail, the asymptotics of the tails uh, for, for some nonlinear function f evaluated at this Bernoulli vector. Um, a more refined question uh, on the bottom that you can ask is, is conditional on this rare event, what does your, <coughs> vector, what does your vector look like? Um, so it's a bit vague, but perhaps say, what, what, how do other functions uh, uh, behave on this event? Um, so, so one example could be, say, um, uh, if you draw an ehrlich Rini graph and condition on the event that it has twice as many triangles as you would expect, then how are the edges distributed in this graph? Is an example of this uh, this type of question in the bottom left. Okay. So um so and then on the right side, there's analogous questions about Gibbs measures, which are sort of smoothed smooth versions in, in some sense of, of the, the questions on the left. Uh, so you can um, take some nonlinear function h as a Hamiltonian for a Gibbs measure on the cube. Uh, you can ask for asymptotics for the, the free energy, the log of the partition function. Um, so in, in, in some sense, that, that generalizes uh, this one on the left, because you could take e to the h to be some, some regularization of the step function uh, of this indicator function for this event. Um, but, but you might lose something in this. Uh, this is sort of, um, I mean, you, you can go past, passing between these is the Varadon lemma and, and Brick's theorem. So. Um, so, so these are highly related. Um, and then the analog of this question is what is a typical uh, <coughs> what does a typical sample look like? Um, so again, these these questions are very well understood uh, if f or h is, is linear, because then it's actually just uh, again a product measure. So it's sort of a, 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 a tilting of your reference measure. Okay, so, um, and then, so what did Surav and Amir do? So they, what they noticed is that um, if the function you're looking at is in some, safe, uh, in some sense a low complexity combination of linear functions, uh, then you can um, still sort of get the same answer in some sense. Um, and so, uh, to be more precise, uh, if, if the Hamiltonian has <coughs> has a, a low complexity gradient, uh, meaning that the, the, the set of values that the gradient can take is, uh, can be efficiently approximated um, by a small net. Uh, then, uh, so for this top right question, you get uh, a formula, an asymptotic formula for the, for the free energy, uh, which is called the naive mean field approximation. Um, and, and this is actually just an identity if, if this is a, a linear functional. Um, and this uh, has been extended by 
um, by Amir student Yun Yang uh, for larger alphabets. Um, and uh, Fanny Ogeri has, has got some shocker results uh, very recently. Okay, and then, and then we have this more refined question is, is about what, what can you say about this measure? Um, and uh, starting with Eldan, uh, who was inspired by this work of Sirav and Amir, um, he was able to obtain some nice descriptions of measures that satisfy this low complexity gradient condition. Um, he, he showed that, right, so if it's, a, if it's a linear functional, then it's a product measure. If this function has a low complexity gradient, uh, then, roughly speaking, it's approximately a mixture of not too many product measures. Is the sort of the vague statement of the of the result, um, and so e to the little od. This is sort of what the right meaning of small, because the the full entropy, the, the dimension of the ambient space is d, and so so the entropy of the mixture of the choice of uh, sort of which state you're in in the mixture is is small compared to the full entropy. Capital H and mu of x. Ah, yes, yes. So this is this, the Shannon entropy of, and then mu sub x is uh, right. Yes. Uh, so this is the um, the um, uh, Bernoulli measure with center of mass x. So so the factors aren't necessarily I I D. They'll have expectation x i. All right, and, and then there's been, um, so Eldon with his student Gross, and then, um, uh, and then this year, uh, uh, Tim Austin have, have um, obtained, uh, have sort of continued this, um, uh, and I'll, I'll also have um, uh, results of this type. So what does little h of x actually mean if you take x somewhere between zero and n? The little h, because the little h is defined on the hypercube, right? On just right. Yeah. So there is this issue. It, it's a bit funny that, um, yeah. It, originally, everything's only defined on the corners. Right. Um, but then this variational problem, you, you get these variational <coughs> problems over the interior um, because you're sort of taking an op uh, you're sort of optimizing over over these tilts towards things with a different cent center of mass. So how do you extend the little h to the interior? Uh, so you could do it harmonically, say, um, or in the so in the examples I'm considering, it's sort of already defined. You know, these triangle counting functions are polynomials that are defined on RD. Uh, but yes, this is an interesting um, uh, uh, question. I mean, di different authors have taken different approaches to how how, how to make sense of that. Can you give again the condition for this to be true? This low complexity thing. Uh, yeah. So it means that uh, you just look at the set of values. You look at grad H. And just look at its range, and if you can affix it, if, if you can cover it by an, a, a small epsilon net. Um, and the way Eldon formulates this is in terms of Gaussian width, but there's sort of comparisons between these. Okay. So if, if H is a random polynomial, it won't be true. If H is a random polynomial, then then it won't be low complexity. Because otherwise, spin glasses would feel it. Fall into that, that would yeah, spin glasses do not fall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's a, a lot more, perhaps nonlinear motivations is too broad a title because a lot of things a lot of people care about are also nonlinear and do not fall into <laughs> All right, so let, let me give you some examples of things that do fall in this, in this class. So, so the, here's a motivating example for the, the Gibbs measure side that I, I, I lifted from a, a remark of um, Eldon in his paper. So you can consider a Hamiltonian on graphs on n vertices, um, which penalizes uh, the presence of triangles. Um, so this, so you, again, you, you can view this as a, the third spectral moment of the Adjacency matrix, uh, we have a minus sign so that we penalize them. Um, scaling by one over root n ends up being the right scaling so that this is on the same scale as the entropy. Um, and so what you would expect is if, if you draw a sample from this measure, you might expect it to look roughly bipartite in some sense. Um, and so uh, if I can go back. Uh, 
so, so this can illustrate what we mean by a, a statement like this. In, in this example, um, <coughs> what, what will these product measures be? Well, it's a mixture of, uh, first you decide where to place the bipartition, and then once you fix that, it's like a stochastic block model, uh, sort of an inhomogeneous erich renyi graph where you have a denser connections between the parts and, and not much inside. So, um, so, so what you should expect is that it'll be a mixture of roughly, so two to the n choices of where the bipartition goes, which again is, so the dimension of the ambient space here is n choose two, so this is um, <coughs> small compared to the, to the dimension. Um, and then once you plant this bipartition, you should have sort of higher density between and, and, and lower density within. This isn't a theorem. I, I, uh, uh, Eldon and Gross have some results in this direction, but I'm pretty sure this is not a theorem. Yet. Okay. Um, so uh, another example. So so back to large deviations. We can consider um, a sort of a ferromagnetic problem of promoting triangles. So so if we if we condition on an event that there are extra triangles, so uh, in GNP, you'd expect n cubed p cubed, let's say you, you see n cubed q cubed for some q larger than p, then you can ask about how the edges are distributed in this graph. And so there's a few natural possibilities that come to mind. So, so one possibility is that this graph will just look like GN cubed. So the way you get extra triangles is just to sprinkle your edges uniformly over the graph. Um, this is perhaps the most natural guess. Um, but there's more efficient ways to, to create extra triangles. Um, so one is, is uh, one efficient way is to just plant a small cleat. So if you plant a small cleat somewhere in the graph, this gives you lots and lots of extra triangles without having to change um, too much. So it actually won't affect the overall edge density. Um, and then the rest of the graph just looks like a normal GNP. Um, and another structure that you could plant would be uh, what I'll call a hub, uh, where you have a small set of vertices that are connected to everybody else. And this gives you a lot of triangles because any, any edge in the complement of the hub will complete a triangle with every vertex inside. inside the hub. Okay, and so uh, we don't have full answers to these questions, but all of the sort of partial answers we have say that it, it seems like it's one of these three. Um, <laughs> so, uh, okay, so, um, so in the dense case, first of all, so there was this work of Chatterjee and Baradhan, who got the large deviations principle, um, and, and they were able to show that for, so, so you have this sort of triangular sector, for much of this sector, the answer is A. It, you sample it, and it, it, it'll look like GNQ. Um, and then this was sharpened by Lubetsky and Zhao, so they, they actually got, they obtained the full, the full region of this plane, um, or this, this triangle, where, where the answer is A, and then they proved that in the, sort of, so if I could draw, I would, yeah, so just imagine a triangle with a little sector removed, and they showed that in the, in the complement, uh, it's, um, it's not G and Q, but it's, it's still not understood I think. Um, but when you say it's G and Q, you don't mean it's exactly G and Q. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry. It's, um, it, it looks like G and Q um, in some sense. Yeah. Uh, so say um, in cut distance would be one way to, to say this. So it, it's sort of the edges are, the edge distribution is in a certain quantitative sense, close, uniformly close to that of G and a typical drop of G and Q. And then a conjecture, which is uh, <coughs> still open, is that in the sparse case, it should be one of these um, uh, planted answers. Uh, so at least for P decaying not um, too fast, so not as fast as n to the minus half, um, if you look at deviations a constant above the expectation, then it's going to be one of these two, and there will be a phase transition depending on the size of the deviation. And so what we do have is we have answers for the upper tail problem uh, that support this. So uh, sort of up to sub-exponential factors, 
the upper tail for triangles agrees with what you get, the lower bounds you get by considering these two events. Um, but it's only up to sub exponential factors, so that still doesn't tell you that the, the conditional on the event it actually looks like one of these cases. Okay, so but um, all right, so I want to talk about general uh, what are called homomorphism counts, not just triangles. Um, so homomorphism count, it's like counting subgraphs, um, a, 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 bit, a bit different though. Um, so uh, a graph homomorphism is just a map between the vertex sets of two graphs that preserves edges. Um, so I have some graph H, which you think of as small with on, on vertices one up to little n, and then a big graph G. Um, the homomorphism counting function, uh, home of HG, is just the number of maps from uh, one up to little n to the, to the big vertex set uh, that preserve all the edges, so, which you can write in terms of the adjacency matrix this way. Um, and then uh, I'll tend to write T of HG instead. Uh, so this is just a normalization that's um, called the homomorphism density. And it just, this is just the probability that a uniform random map uh, pres preserves edges. So, I mean, one indication of why this is more convenient than subgraph counts is that in the case of cycles, this is just a spectral moment. So, if you'll recall, um, for the third spectral moment, it's off by a factor of six. And so, you, you know, for these sort of non-injectivity reasons, and then sort of there's some, you, you might occasionally map to the same <coughs> vertex. Um, it's not the same as subgraph counts, but uh, you can sort of translate the two. Okay, uh, so, so Chatterjee and Baradon, what they did was um, they got a large deviations principle for erdos renyi graphs uh, that are dense. Um, so if, if P is fixed between zero and one, then they got an LDP for the sequence of measures. Uh, now for LDPs, the measures need to be on a common probability space. And here the, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's changing from uh, one end to the next. It's, it's, uh, on a larger dimensional space. But you can put all of these inside a, a really big space uh, called graphons that I'll come back to. And, and, and so you can view these as a sequence of measures on, on this topological space of graphons. Uh, and then they got a large deviations principle. Um, graphons are, are very nice. Um, they're sort of, they have this top, the, the, well, I'm not gonna tell you the topology, but it, it's sort of the right one if you're interested in homomorphism counts. Um, so homomorphism counts are continuous in this topology on graphon space, um, which ends up being sort of a topological reformulation of this um, classic counting lemma from extremal, uh, extremal graph theory. And so since these are continuous, you, this, this gives you LDPs for, the, uh, uh, for these homomorphism counts. In the density. Okay, so um, so we're interested in the sparse case. So what if uh, the conductivity parameter T <coughs> is decaying like um, n to the minus some constant? So graphons are, are aren't of any help here. I mean, it's sort of um, it's it, well, it's just sort of trivial. So if if, if you have an erdos renyi graph of this density, uh, then there's there's an obvious graphon that is an excellent approximation to this graph, which is just identically zero. So you, you don't really get anything from graphons. Um, so there have been extensions of graphons uh, to handle sparser uh, graphs. So there's uh, what are called LP graphons. Um, but the LP graphon theory, at least for our purposes, uh, isn't, isn't sufficient. Um, but uh, so the first progress that was made on the sparse case was of um, throughout in a year. And so they got um, the upper tail uh, for, for homomorphism counts, uh, allowing P to decay like some polynomial. And yeah, so they got some, some, it could go down like some constant depending on the graph. Um, but it's of the form uh, some small constant over the max degree uh, times the number of edges. And so if you work out what they get for, in the case of triangles, it's uh, uh, you can go down as fast as about n to the minus 1 over 41. Um, 
Eldon, in Eldon's improvements, um, subsequent improvements, he got this down to um, 1 over 18. Um, but there's, there aren't any <coughs> extra ingredients in terms of um, improving this kappa. I mean, it's, fr fr from his paper, you can't do anything more than improve this little constant C of the numerator. It doesn't help with this dependence on the, um, on the, on the number of edges. Uh, that's the max degree. Yeah. So, okay, yeah, so H has um, max degree delta sub H and uh, E sub H is the edge set. Okay, so our result is, is to extend um, is to extend the result to, to, to sparser graphs. Uh, so, so we could get the upper tail for homomorphism counts. Um, so it, the, the, the speed is uh, n squared P to the max degree um, log one over P. And then there's a formula for the dependence on delta, and we can allow p to go down to n to the minus one over three times the max degree minus two, which doesn't look like the optimal matrix, but it's an improvement. So, so just some remarks. Um, so this uh, this constant c. So what we actually prove is is we we get sort of a large deviations principle. We we show that. The upper tail is given by the solution of a of a an optimization problem. This optimization problem is is pretty non-trivial, and so there was a whole other paper of Bhattacharya, Ganguly, Lubetsky, and Zhao that solved this problem, and and, and got the formula and saw that it matches uh, what you get by guessing that it should either be a Planck clique or a Planck tuple. Um, and this formula is is valid down. This formula is valid as a solution to the uh, it is the solution to the variational problem uh, down to n to the minus one over delta. And then, and then there's gonna be a phase transition where the hub is no longer viable and then below two over delta is a, the problem changes completely. So, 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 so in some sense we've, we've, brought, we've brought the sparsity exponent within a factor of three of, of what's in some sense the optimum, at, at, at least for this formula. Okay, uh, yeah, so we actually do a little bit better in general, but I don't want to show you the, the full formula for the, um, for kappa, but uh, we do better for irregular graphs. So in particular for stars, we can do one over two delta minus one. Um, in the case of cycles, mm. the fact that it's a function purely of the spectrum lets us sharpen our arguments even more, and we can get down to the optimal, the optimal exponent one half, so this is one over the max degree. Um, uh, we could, for a technical reason, we only went down to length four, and we had one third uh, for triangles. Um, but in independent work of O'Jerry, uh, she got down, got the optimal uh, one half all the way down. Nick, what you keep saying that one half is the way for the top. Go all the way to one over the uh, Except for this, uh, the planted hub. The, the solution to the variation of the Yeah, so what I, I mean is uh, the that solution with, with the planted hub. Yeah, so it should go down to there. Um, right, and then if you go below that, then yes, it, sh it should just be what you get from uh, just by the get Right. There are reasons that our approaches and also uh, Fanny's approaches uh, can't go beyond into the minus half for cycles. Um, you need, you'll need some extra arguments. Uh, right, but yeah, there's a, a, a sort of phase transition at, at one half. And, um, well, yeah, and, and the problem is also very interesting for, for even sparser graphs. Um, I don't have time to, to get into that. Okay, um, yeah, and, and I won't have time to talk about lower tails, but our test also gets lower tails. Okay, so I'll, I'll just give an, a, an overview of some of the ideas. So just a, a general um, abstract formulation of what we want to show. We have a Bernoulli vector, which in our case is a matrix, and we want to get an upper bound on the probability that it lies in some set. Uh, script L, so in our case L is, is a super level set for some function like triangle counts. Um, we, we, we don't have to care about the lower bound because we already, we already get a lower bound uh, just from computing the probability of this planted clique or hub. So, 
so so the hard part for us really is just to do the upper bound. Okay, and IP is this uh, this rate function, which is just the um, relative entropy uh, between a tilted um, Bernoulli measure with center of mass x and and just the usual one with center of mass um, p on the Connie's factor. Okay, so how can we show something like this? Okay, so um, well, before I go into this, I should say that the way uh, Surav and Amir did this in their previous work was to get uh, to prove this naive mean field approximation for Gibbs measures, and then to sort of a, apply that to a smooth approximation to this step function. Um, but you lose a lot in this sort of approximation process. And so what we wanted to do was to just look more directly and not go through Gibbs measures, and not have to do any kind of um, lossy approximation. Okay, so uh, first you can observe that what we want to show is true with error zero uh, for half spaces just because that's the super level set for a linear functional, which is already well understood. Um, okay, with, with a bit of effort, you can show also that this extends um, for, to any compact and convex set. Um, so sort of using the previous bullet point and, uh, and the minimax theorem, so this, I say exercise, this is literally an exercise. <laughs> <laughs> and it's literally in the literal sense of, of literal. So this, this, this is the literal sense. So now you have to buy the book. Yeah. <laughs> it was a Springer, so you can download it. <laughs> okay, but uh, so, well, all right, so compact convex sets, that still doesn't help us because the super level set of anything we're interested in, unless it's a linear functional, it is not a convex set. Um, but then here's where the, the complexity, of course, comes in, is um, if, what if, if the set we're interested in can be covered efficiently with convex bodies, then we could just apply union bounds. Um, so it has to be convex bodies on which your function is essentially constant, um, because then, okay, so here you can just do, um, uh, so this step is union bound, um, and then you get this minimum over what you get on each on each uh, convex body. Um, but then the minimum over all of these of, of the minimum over the body is just uh, the infimum over the union. And then because uh, um, this is essentially constant, you uh, so, 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 uh, so then you did, well this set is essentially um, the function you're uh, the set you're interested. Um, because the function is essentially constant on these, on these bodies. Okay, so all you, all you lose is this metric entropy here. So if, if you can make that small compared to, the, uh, to what you know the answer is, then, then, then you win. Okay, how much time do I have? Uh, maybe five minutes. Oh. All right, so, uh, all right, so that you could have just pulled out of a, a book. Um, uh, but uh, so, so, so now our task is, is to design these efficient coverings, uh, which we were able to do. And uh, sort of with hindsight, we realized that what we had done was kind of a quantitative version of, of, of Chatterjee and Baradon. Um, so, so what we were really doing is, is a quantitative version of, of, um, of the regularity method and this, this Raffon theory. Um, so let me tell you a bit about that. Okay, so, so I won't, I don't want to introduce all the notation of graph on, so I'll just, I'll leave it at the, in the setting of, of, of matrices. So, so I'll write Xn for the set of weighted adjacency matrices, so the entries are between 0 and 1. And then we have a, what's called the cut norm on this space, which is just to take the maximum um, over the, um, the sum of, so, so if this were an adjacency matrix, this would just be counting the number of edges passing from the set T, to the, from the set S to the set T. Um, and so uh, there's a, we have the weak regularity lemma. So that the regularity lemma is, is, goes back to Semiretti. There's a, a weak version due to Fries and Kanan, uh, which says the following. Um, so for any weighted adjacency matrix and any sort of level of precision K, um, you can partition the vertex set into this bounded number uh, K, 
parts um, and find a, another weighted adjacency matrix which is um, constant on these rectangles formed by the partition um, that approximates your matrix very well in the cut line. Okay, so that's sort of the first core uh, fact from the regularity method. But the, the other core fact is, is um, the counting lemma, which says, that, so this says that these homomorphism counting functions um, are continuous. So you actually get uh, a Lipschitz constant here. Okay. So, so, and then if we're doing graphons, then this, you can use this cut metric to, to get this, um, to get a topology on the space of graphons, but but I won't go into this. Okay, but yeah, in the setting of graphons, this regularity lemma is related to the compactness of graphon space, and the counting lemma says that these functions are continuous. Okay, so that I already said. Um, so, so taken together, so the, sort of the, the key, the upshot of this that was key for um, Chatterjee and Baradon was that uh, you can cover the full space of adjacency matrices or, or weighted adjacency matrices um, with neighborhoods of a bounded number of graphons on which these uh, functionals are essentially constant. Okay, which sounds like what we want. But um, since we're looking at sparse graphs, we need, we're gonna need some more uh, quantitative estimates. So, so in particular, this two over square root log <coughs> is, is not gonna be good enough for us. Okay, um, all right, so I think I will skip uh, this part. Um, this goes a bit more into the guts of the proof um, and just tell you what, what we get. So what we prove are versions of the regularity lemma and the counting lemma that are kind of optimized for sparse heavy frame graphs. So, so it's, uh, I mean those, what, what I told you on the previous slide, those, those are in some sense optimal um, but they're not optimal for random graphs. Uh, here we're looking at random graphs in the large deviations regime, so you might think that we need to deal with the worst case, um, but it turns out you still have some wiggle room. Um, and so what we say is that you can cut out the small event, so that's part B here. So after cutting out a small event, this is our, our wiggle room, uh, then uh, you can partition your space of all adjacency matrices into neighborhoods of low rank matrices. Um, so there's relatively few of them, so that's part A. Uh, and then part C says you, you get a nice approximation and if, uh, if we, we use the spectral norm rather than the cut norm. Okay. Um, so the, the real key here, the, the part that's most worth pointing out here is that we have this peak. Uh, so, so you can, so the, the trivial bound on the norm of these guys um, it's so, so for an erdos Rindy graph, it's for own Frobenius eigenvalue is going to be um, a size NP rather than N for general graphs. And so you really want this to be small compared to the trivial bound NP. And so you can do that if you let, if you let the rank grow a little bit. And then you also have this brand for K that you can tune um, if you want to make this event in part be small. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention is this, this um, <coughs> counting lemma. Uh, so here we, we want some improved Lipschitz constant, really, for, uh, for random graphs. Uh, and it turns out you can do this if you first cut out an event. This event has to depend on what graph you're looking at. Uh, so it's, you can see, you, graphons sort of give you more than you ask for. If you only want to understand tails for a thick subgraph, graphons sort of gives you more than you ask for because it, it lets you approximate all homomorphism functions. Um, here we hope sort of have to focus on, on one at a time. And so, so the bad event that we have to cut out uh, just depends on what you're trying to count. Um, and so this bad event is, is that there's some subgraph of, of your graph H that has unusually large homomorphism counts. Okay, and so part A just says that this bad event is small. And then we get um, a Lipschitz constant again in the, in the operator norm. 
Um, and so the key is that, that this is the trivial bound, and so we beat this um, as long as this is small compared to this. And then what I'd like to point out here is that, uh, um, so this I, I don't think is optimal. Um, so if you could replace this max degree uh, with the number one, then you would get the, this all the way down to p is decaying like n to the minus one over delta. Um, so you'd get sort of the optimal range for that formula uh, that I talked about. Um, but that's, that's an open problem. <coughs> so that's open problem number one. So, so uh, it would be interesting to see if it's possible to prove an improved counting lemma with respect to the spectral norm. Um, but it may be that you need to use some, something else. So, so you can use any convex body. And in fact, for cycles, we, we, we sort of use uh, slabs uh, rather than these operator norm balls. So, so maybe if you switch to some other kind of convex body, you can get a better, a better counting lemma. Um, obvious other questions are whether you could allow the consider um, sparser graphs. All of this was, respect, was with respect to this uh, reference measure GMP, but you could consider other ones. Um, you could consider ones that aren't product measures, like uh, deregular graphs. Um, and then the, there's, there's the whole, again, the other side of the table is to do things for Gibbs measures. And uh, for, for random graphs, th these Gibbs measures are known as um, exponential random graphs. And so, so it would be interesting to see if our approaches can improve uh, some estimates for the free energy um, that were obtained uh, by Chatterjee and Dembo. Um, and, and then there was work of Chatterjee and Diaconis that looked at the structure of these graphs. Um, and also of Eldon and Gross uh, for somewhat sparse graphs. Okay, so that's, that's all. Questions? Uh, an unexpected large number of triangles. Can you say what is the number of uh, other shapes functionally? I mean, it's related to the second kind of structural equation you have mentioned. In terms of random matrix, for example, how does the spectral measure change? Right. Um, so we can't say, but we can have some guesses. Yeah. So if you believe that it's just this planted clique or planted hub, then what that's saying is that you have a sort of just have one or two eigenvalues coming out. You just have this low rank structure. Um, and then if, yeah, so if everything else stays where it's supposed to be on the, in sort of the semicircle of distribution, and you have these extra guys, then you can compute other cycle lengths. Um, yeah, you could compute a lot of other things. Certainly cycles, because those depend on the, on the spectrum. And in the other regimes, you don't have a picture You mean for more sparse groups? Or? If, it's not, if you're not in the click regime, if you're in the click or hub. Right, yeah, so click or hub, yeah, both of those are low rank perturbation as to the, to the yeah, so in, in both cases, you should, um, you can at least write down the guess. But we don't have that, I mean, this bad event that we cut out for the regularity lemma, it's just a, um, an event involving spectral, it's a random matrix sort of proposition that just says that there aren't too many outliers. Um, but if you could get a stronger thing where you, you actually know that all but two eigenvalues stick, uh, then you could say much more precisely. I mean, another thing people are interested in is the whole spectrum, say. I mean, you, so you could consider the, the entire, the, so the, the, the whole empirical measure, the empirical spectral distribution. So this is completely not inside this regime. Um, we also consider largest eigenvalues, and we get an LDT for those, but only if they're very far from the bulk. Um, and so when the largest <coughs> eigenvalues are at the same scale as the bulk, again, we can't use these sort of low complexity gradient type um, I mean, it's just the wrong answer, um, but there has been some recent progress on that by uh, Alice DNA and, and so on. Um, 
but it's, it's a different answer also. Okay, well, let's thank.